The helicopter can do a lot of things that a conventional aircraft cannot do. It can hover and reverse and is extremely maneuverable. As they proved in Vietnam, helicopters have become an indispensable part of the modern battlefield. They can act as stable heavy fire gun platforms in support of ground troops or acting independently, rush troops into battle or pluck a downed pilot from a jungle. One thing that a helicopter cannot do, that a conventional plane can, is achieve a high speed. There is a pretty well absolute limit to how fast they can go, because of the differences in speed at various points on their rotors. The tip may be travelling at near supersonic speed, while the helicopter is doing only 200 miles an hour. Even compound helicopters, with winglets and forward thrusting engines, suffer enormous drag penalties from the rotors, and cannot be expected to easily approach the speeds attained by a modern fighter. But helicopters do what they do extremely well. And there are many applications, not only military, ideally suited to a helicopter. The biggest advantage they have can be put very simply. They can fly vertically. It is the justification for their existence. They can land on ordinary ships, in fields or forest clearings. They can take off from virtually anywhere. And if they can't land somewhere, they can hover just above it. If only they weren't so slow. Helicopters are only 50 years old, and yet they've developed so fast that their limits have not only been deduced, they've been reached. Modern combat aircraft have become increasingly addicted to concrete. Miles of it, straight and flat, with acres of parking bays and hard stands, and so have their support aircraft. All of this is expensive and requires massive permanent bases to support the concrete. These bases are scattered round the globe, serving every potential belligerent in the various alliances and hostile camps. Any theory of conventional modern warfare worth its salt is based around a preliminary battle for air superiority, either on a local or theatre level. And the easiest way to do this is to destroy the infrastructure needed to support an aerial force. In effect, the airfields are huge, immovable targets. Some countries have made their highways with straight stretches that are strengthened to act as dispersal sites for their planes in emergency, foreseeing what would happen to their bases. The idea of a rocket-assisted takeoff works better if your plane is actually capable of flight and if your rocket is powerful and safe enough to use. A rocket-assisted takeoff gives two major benefits. First, it allows fuel savings in getting a specified load into the air, and second, it shortens the takeoff. These benefits have long been recognised, and powerful working systems of rocket and jet assisted takeoff, RATO and JATO, have been highly developed at times, though they have not always been particularly safe to be around. One enthusiastic user of such systems was the Second World War German Luftwaffe. They plugged their highly efficient, though cantankerous and dangerous little rocket pods onto just about every plane they had at one time or another, with considerable success. Enormous quantities of fuel are normally consumed at takeoff, and to be able to lessen that demand can considerably increase a plane's range. The second benefit, that of a shortened runway, has become more important subsequently, as planes have become less and less tolerant of rough ground conditions. It should be noted that German airfields became bomb crater collections on an almost permanent basis through much of the final phases of the war.
and shortened takeoff would have certainly been a virtue. The chemicals involved in these rocket engines were highly active and required careful and methodical handling. The violence of the reactions to occur in firing the rocket could all too easily be set off by accident and the results of such accidents could be devastating. The protective clothing was worn with alacrity in recognition of the danger. Flying boats gained considerably from the use of rocket assisted takeoff. Normally, a flying boat required a long run to unstick itself from the water, and the fuel tax of this was enormous. Then again, for a flying boat, it's impossible to actually damage the runway. The United States was another user of RATO, and extensive testing of various units was undertaken. Here a Martin B-26 gets a rocket shove to reduce its runway use enormously. The interest in RATO grew considerably with the arrival of the jet engine. Jets had their special needs, and high on the list is the long concrete runway. Jet engines are susceptible to damage from ground debris and also tend to have high takeoff and landing speeds. Their advantages come into play in the air. On the ground, they demand mollycoddling. The world's air forces had to come to grips with the problem of the runway, despite their acute awareness of their vulnerability. Rocket and jet assistance still were of more benefit in fuel savings than they were in shortening takeoff length and required their own additional backup, personnel and supplies, including some stores that were highly volatile. As systems, their inherent deficiencies and clumsiness made their overall use limited. Though a lot of effort went into the various attempts to make workable setups available, their widespread utilisation remained impractical. The most extreme scheme to use assisted takeoff to do away with runways was the zero length launch system. This can perhaps best be described as shooting aeroplanes off of the back of trucks. Tests of the idea were carried out with various aircraft with surprising success considering how odd the aim appears to be on the surface. The launch apparatus was developed by the Martin company with the obvious aim of increasing the dispersal of aircraft and lessening their attachment to established bases. The first launching was conducted on the 15th of December 1953, with an unserviceable, unmanned F-84 being shot off into the desert. The first piloted launch was made on the 5th of January 1954. Recorded acceleration loads were only 3.5 Gs, marginally above a standard aircraft carrier catapult launch. When the few seconds of rocket burn were over, the plane had been brought up to a speed of 175 miles per hour, well above the F-84's stall speed and the pilots reported no difficulty in controlling the aircraft. Zero length launch worked, but it didn't really answer the need for aircraft that could take off vertically in a practical way. And though it was refined and applied to several aircraft types, it was in the end abandoned. What was needed was the ability for fixed wing aeroplanes to take off in the same way as rotary wing aircraft, straight up and there has been constant research and development of various ideas to achieve that. 
Perhaps one of the more immediate solutions to present itself was to use an aircraft's propellers as rotary wings on a horizontal plane to get into the air and then to swivel them to a vertical attitude for level flight. The Bell XV3 tilt rotor, completed in 1955, worked from this theory and indeed its propellers were very reminiscent of a helicopter's rotors. It was to fly for 15 years and provided a lot of valuable information. The Curtis Wright X-19 aircraft used propellers rather than rotors, although their shape was highly exaggerated with very broad cord and extravagant twist. These were driven by two engines mounted side by side in the fuselage through a complex series of gearboxes and shafts that could be run by one or both of the engines. Two planes were built, but only one flew. The program was cancelled before the second one could take to the air. The test series was short, disrupted by mechanical troubles, and rounded off with an in-flight failure on the test plane that saw it crash. In the period from its first tentative hover in November 1963 to the crash in August 1964, the plane left the ground only 50 times, for a total accumulated flying time of less than four hours. The X-19 had developed from an earlier Curtis Wright privately funded test aircraft, and the two demonstrated enough about the concept of tilt propellers to suggest that the system had its advantages, encouraging the company to further research and development, though to this date this has not led to any further aircraft. Doing away with the complex drive mechanisms, Bell's XV-15 tilted its engines, which were, to allow this, mounted on the tips of its wings. They drove large propellers that were a compromise between the requirements of helicopter rotor and aircraft propeller. The XV-15 made its first hovering flight on the 3rd of May 1977, and the two examples constructed have been highly successful, making hundreds of flights. The first actual transition from helicopter mode to level flight was made in July 1979 and the program has been so convincing that by 1983 the US Navy had ordered a development of the plane into production as the V-22 Osprey. With all the systems that require a plane to behave as a helicopter and then change over to level flight, there are two very difficult areas to sort out. The first difficulty is to give sufficient control to the pilot during the helicopter flight mode. And the second is to safely go through the actual transition to behaving like a normal aeroplane. After that, as they say, it's a piece of cake until the time comes to reverse the process and land. The idea of tilting various bits of the airframe to provide both takeoff lift and then forward thrust has also been repeatedly applied to the entire wing, engines included. This allows a less artificial positioning of the engines than sticking them to the end of the wing and can allow the wing control surfaces to be used to control the plane in hover. However, it means that the surface that is to provide in-flight lift has to be transitioned to level flight and this presents a very difficult phase where the propellers cease to act as rotary wings before the wing itself is actually working to keep the plane in the air. The Vertol Model 76, developed as a test craft for the Army and Navy, flew from 1957 to its retirement in 1965, and in that time made hundreds of successful flights. It was a very influential little plane, with much of the work done in sorting out its controls and giving it reasonable stability flowing on to inform later tilt-wing projects. Perhaps the most important of its successes was built for the Air Force by an LTV Hillier Ryan consortium, 
based on Hillier's earlier X-18 craft, which had exhibited some vices in its career, particularly in hover control. The new plane was to be a much larger and more ambitious project, and was built to a 1961 Department of Defence specification to meet the needs of the services for a VTOL transport. It was given the number XC-142, signifying very clearly that the intention was for the plane to go into full production. Five of the planes were built, four-engined, 58 foot long and with a 67 foot wingspan. Their proportions suggest that they are small planes, but they are quite big. They had a gross weight vertical takeoff capability of 41,000 pounds, which made them quite a well-sized proposition for carrier resupply or battlefield aircraft. The propellers were not linked directly to the engines, but to a common cross shaft. This guarded against asymmetric behavior should one of the engines quit with the plane in hover, which would otherwise have led to certain disaster. There was a lot that worked about the XC-142, but there was enough that didn't work to keep it from mass production. After the experience on the project, there was a lot of talk about getting back to the drawing board. Among its vices were transmission failures in the complex cross-linking, and that system's intolerance of wing flex. What may be small problems in level flight become major if they occur during hover, and in the period of testing of the XC-142s, four of the five were badly damaged in accidents while in hover position. The overwhelming problem with them was, however, that they vibrated badly and were almost insanely noisy. Up against the much bigger Hercules, carrying three times the load, twice the distance, relatively quietly and with short takeoff and landing to boot, the XC-142 Tiltwing, while still capable of being further developed, was abandoned. Aircraft with tilting ducts were another variation on the theme of swivelling parts of the aircraft, somewhat similar to the tilt props. The ducts had several additional virtues, in that they augmented the propeller thrust and also worked as additional wing surface in level flight. Vanes inside the duct could be used to give better control at delicate points during transition and propeller turbulence was kept away from the wing. The Doak Model 16, completed in 1957, was among the most successful of early vertical takeoff aircraft and provided NASA, who conducted tests on it in conjunction with the Army, with much information. In particular, studies of the plane's power needs in hover and in transitional flight made increasingly clear the enormity of the task ahead in the pursuit of truly practical vertical takeoff aeroplanes. The ducted fan system actually has a lot to recommend it. The Bell Corporation's two X-22As effectively proved the idea as workable and very effective in a long career. The X-22 first flew in March 1966. In August of that year, one was damaged beyond repair, but the other was to fly on till 1984 and was retired, still flyable, to museum life. The X-22's contribution to the science of flight was not limited to the ducted system, but it did show that the system works, and though there have to date not been any production aircraft using the configuration, the work of the X-22 still serves as a reminder of its potential. Another point about fans that had been established was that they considerably increased the effectiveness of jet engines in producing hover thrust, and this was the basis of the turbojet-powered Ryan XV-5A. The engine's thrust could be used either normally to propel the plane in level flight, or diverted to the fans for hover mode. The two main lifting fans were embedded in the wing, with another stabilising fan in the nose. 
Once airborne, the fan's airflow was deflected by vanes to start the plane forward, and then the engine's thrust was diverted to the jet pipes and the fan covers in the wing were closed, theoretically leaving a handy little fighter plane. The disadvantages included the domination of the available space in the plane by all that ducting, fans and engine. However, there was a lot of promise to the use of fans with jets, and Ryan published proposals for a variety of applications, including high-speed interceptors, heavy transports and passenger airliners. these various avenues to vertical flight were being tested at the same time. The end of the Second World War had set off a period of reflection on the lessons for future warfare, and there had been several important factors indicating that vertical takeoff aircraft were of the highest priority of need. The US Navy, not as beset by concrete as the Air Force, had its own problems, one of which was the experience of locking up large numbers of expensive warships with escorting creeping convoys of merchant shipping. To release some of these warships for other duties, it would help if the merchantmen could carry more of their own defences. And from this came one of the earliest VTOL design competitions, with contracts going to two manufacturers, Convair and Lockheed, to build prototypes of midget VTOL fighters to operate from cargo ships. They were both to operate as tail sitters. The Lockheed plane was given the designation XFV-1, its configuration sprang from the active mind of Kelly Johnson, Lockheed's design wizard. The plane, called the Salmon, after a period of experimentation and development, refining the elements of its shape, came out looking superficially quite similar overall to a conventional small propeller-driven aircraft. The biggest variation from the norm in its shape was the 45-degree angling of the set of four tail fins that graced its rear. Construction of the salmon proceeded fairly smoothly, and there was to be only four years between the order and the first flight of what must be conceded to be a very radical proposal. In that time, an enormous number of problems had to be confronted and overcome. From the position of the pilot to the use of casters on the fin tips as undercarriage, there were many aspects of the plane that were unique. While construction proceeded on some parts of the main assembly, development work continued alongside, refining other components and overcoming many problems that would ordinarily never concern an aircraft designer. The position of the pilot was one area that caused a lot of problems and a satisfactory arrangement was never really sorted out. Other areas of the plane's special requirements, like maintaining fuel flow, were however resolved. Also overcome was the problem of undercarriage capable of settling the plane onto its tail in landing. Given the impossibility of setting what direction the tail would be moving in hover at the instant of touchdown, or of guaranteeing truly vertical descent or a level landing platform on a boat at sea, the problem was complex. The solution looks deceptively simple, suggesting the wheels of a shopping trolley. A further complication around the pilot's position was the absolute necessity to be able to eject safely. There was obviously no way a normal ejection seat would do anything but shoot the pilot into the ground if used in a hover, and a special seat was designed to shoot the pilot up or forward depending upon the plane's attitude. Because it didn't shoot him straight up but at an angle, it also needed to throw him further to attain a useful height for a parachute to open. The system was, understandably, extensively honed over a series of tests.
The XFV-1 was fitted with temporary fixed conventional landing gear for its first test flight series. It being wisely acknowledged as necessary that the plane prove that it actually flew controllably in normal operation before proceeding with the more adventurous business of standing it on its tail. Even while undergoing its taxi tests, it showed a willingness to get airborne and its first flight passed without problem. In level flight, the little plane proved to have no daunting vices and the series proceeded to high altitude test transitions. Here, problems were encountered, including one that was very serious and was not to be overcome. In transition from level to vertical flight, the plane's momentum saw it gain several hundred feet before it stabilized in hover. The pilot, with his back to the ground, was therefore left in a skittish and difficult to manoeuvre aircraft, trying to lower himself with little to no idea of what was below him, or how far away it was. Even screwing his neck round, he couldn't see much below him. This was obviously going to make landings significantly more difficult than was desirable, especially if one keeps in mind the deck of a freighter or a destroyer in mid-Atlantic. Despite the worrying experience of the pilots in hover, the tests went on to their next phase, to actually take off in the plane. Here, another insurmountable problem arose, with the plane's available power. There simply wasn't enough of it. In addition, there was inadequate control available to the pilot in hover. The combination of these factors, which made attempts at takeoff nearly impossible, Allied to the experience of the pilots in preparing for any vertical landings, experienced in the air, and a very unnerving prospect to look forward to, was enough to seal the fate of the project. It was written off as a learning experience, and the plane was retired. If one were desperate for a failure to attribute to Kelly Johnson to offset his stream of resounding triumphs, then the XFV-1 might be it. However, as a test plane, it answered a lot of questions and it posed a set of new and very interesting problems for those working on vertical takeoff aircraft. The other plane ordered in the 1950 decision, Convair's XFY-1 Pogo, proceeded in parallel and in competition with the Lockheed plane and did not have that experience to draw on. However, it was a very different design, being a delta-winged plane with dorsal and ventral fins matching the wings. The multitude of control surfaces still struggled to get enough grip on the propeller's slipstream to give much stability to hovering flight. But in many other aspects, the plane worked quite well. The Delta gave it more strength for less weight, and also gave it much better performance at low speeds and high angles of attack, obviously important in the transitions at takeoff and before landing. Unlike the Lockheed plane, there was no way to configure the Pogo for level takeoff, and so its first flight also included its first vertical takeoff and landing. The experience the Lockheed pilots had already had was repeated in the Convair plane. Though it was far more capable of carrying out the transitions and actually taking off and landing, there was still no way for the pilot to see what was happening once he was in hover, staring at the sky. The coaching of ground crew by radio was of some assistance. But in all the tests of the tail sitters, the situation of the pilot in landing was unsatisfactory. The powerful Allison engine would drag the plane up before settling into the hover, and the blind descent was a nightmare. Another notable vertical attitude plane was the Bell X-13. The preliminary work on the problems of the feasibility of reaction controls for jet aircraft had begun in 1947, backed by the US Navy, with the same objective that had created the Pogo and Salmon, self-defending convoys. 
When the Navy ran out of funds, the Air Force's attention was already rising in relation to its own needs, and the X-13 Vertijets were to fill an Air Force order. The secret of the X-13 was that it hung on a hook and was designed to operate from a trailer. After a careful series of gradual steps ironing the problems out as they went, the team working on the project achieved what, on the face of it, seems an improbable aim. A portable plane complete with aerodrome. The system worked quite well, but after the initial fanfare of astonished applause when the plane first strutted its stuff, it seems to have immediately faded into an impenetrable obscurity. The two X-13s were among the most successful early jet VTOL aircraft, and the success and efficiency of their unlikely sounding mission was perhaps as advanced as anything in the vertical field before the Harrier. They proved that vertical flight on jet thrust alone was both technically feasible and practical, and left little to question about the flexibility and usefulness of such an arrangement. But they would have been a way left to go to get it operational. The pilots still could not see, and there were loading limitations. Even without the weight of the retractable undercarriage, the thrust of the available engines left little reserve of power. The X-13 idea could have been refined, but it's highly unlikely now that it ever will be. Using jets to obtain sufficient thrust to go straight up required a lot more power from the engine than was readily available until quite recently. And the seemingly obvious solution to this was to have two sets of motors, with one set only involved in getting into the air. Hence, the Rolls-Royce flying bedstead, which was involved in trying to sort out the tricky business of developing controls for a plane that's rising on a pillar of jet thrust. The system developed on such vehicles operates very much in the same way as the lunar lander. The principle of control is reaction jets. It was still true that the accident that happened in hover was generally going to leave no time for recovery, but the work done with aircraft like these broke down a lot of the barriers standing in the way of vertical flight, and made possible the use of far more conventional aeroplane shapes in VTOL rolls, though of course they themselves don't look like conventional aircraft at all. Where the Bell X-13 had quite practically hung itself up on a hook after a flight, there's been a lot of work on various systems for shortening the required landing length of aircraft, including another apparently fairly outrageous suggestion, to grab them with an arrestor hook and then slam them on their bellies on a rubber runway. Yet this too has been taken to the point where it actually works, and has been extensively tested. It was developed by the British, but the Martin Company showed a lot of interest in it as a companion system for their zero-length launch trucks, and the British showed the system off to several impressed American delegations. Despite the potential to miss the hook and sail back over the ship's side on occasion, the system worked after a fashion and obviously cannot have been as silly as it sounds. Of course, crash barriers and arrestor wires have long been refined aboard carriers and many planes have been fitted at one time or another to operate with these mechanical interventions. Apart from extreme examples like the rubber runway concept, the planes have clung to the weight penalty of their wheels and most of the time such landings are routine and go through without incident, though it does remain hazardous.
If nothing else, the rubber runway serves to remind us of the lengths to which experimentation was pushed in trying to bring the demands of aircraft for takeoff and landing distance to heel. Vertical takeoff experimentation saw another variation in the Bell Model 65 with its swivelling jet engine. It had a relatively short career and though it flew with the engine in both positions, it never did so on the same flight. No full transitions were made with the little plane. However, it settled several important basic issues and gave Bell the information it needed to proceed with its next, more ambitious design proposal. The Model 65 used engines off a missile and when they burnt out after four and a half hours use, that was the end of the project. One thing the Model 65 does well is show off its control jets. The nozzles can clearly be seen in the end of the wing and the ducting along the side to take the compressed air to the rear cluster of nozzles is also evident. By constant and sometimes painful trial and error, the controls needed to hold a plane in relative obedience while hovering have been sorted out. The normal method of control with jet engine VTOL planes is the use of air pumped to the plane's extremities, being vented as needed to hold position. In early wind tunnel tests with large working models of the system, four pilots sat at controls operating different bits. It was extremely complicated. Now, though not less complicated, it's a lot more automated. The Bell Company has been absorbed in vertical flight research from the early 40s and has constructed an impressive range of prototypes exploring different approaches to the problems of getting a plane into the air without a huge runway. In 1956, they won a contract with the US Air Force to build a new plane, given the name X-14, to test their work on the concept of thrust vectoring and to serve as a test bed to sort out how to give pilots sensible controls for hovering flight, an area that was then still resolutely proving difficult. The X-14 was to be one of the most important aircraft in the long saga of vertical flight experimentation. In 1954 and 55, Bell had gone to the Air Force with a proposal for a VTOL lightweight day fighter and had managed to get the Air Force very interested in the proposal. As a step in exploring the technology that would be needed for such a plane, the Air Force had authorised the company to build a technology testbed aircraft. Bell's primary concern was to test the use of vectored thrust, which seemed to offer the simplest solution to the use of jet engines, allowing a plane that sat in a horizontal attitude. The test plane was built as fast as possible and as cheaply as possible, which coincidentally led to it being as small as possible. It incorporated existing engines and scavenged its parts from all sorts of aircraft spares. It had no canopy and no ejector seat. It was the minimum needed to do the job. The scheme of vectored thrust is to blow the hot engine exhaust through movable grills that aim them either at the ground or to the rear of the plane. On the face of it, a very simple approach. However, as is usual in these things, there are many complications. For example, if you point a powerful jet engine at something at close range, it is likely to do considerable damage. It will dig a pit in your lawn, or it will make your concrete bubble and smoke alarmingly. As a result, one of the things that the engineers working on the X-14 project had to turn their attention to was the constitution of concrete and how to build a heat and blast resistant surface for the X-14 to test on. Here, if you'll pardon the expression, is the concrete embodiment of the X-Plane series. Aviation's history is the chronology of a cascade of ideas, forming in the minds of individuals and being honed, expanded or debunked. The generations of knowledge have succeeded one another at a bewildering speed, drawing constantly on what is proven to imagine what might be provable. It's been only when a hypothesis is put to the test that its full meaning has been discovered, both in the significance, success and implication of the idea and also in the snags, complications, side effects, hazards and failure. On two levels, the X-Series enriched aviation by turning theory into hardware and then turning that hardware into practical machines. There are so many famous firsts associated with the X-Series, breaking the sound barriers, testing new materials, swing wings, high altitude flight, 
The X-14 itself was the first vectored thrust aircraft. In addition, there have been thousands of less famous firsts associated with technical advances, control systems and avionics. Much of what is known about flight today and affects the planes of today and will affect those of tomorrow rests on the results obtained by planes in the X series. It even seems likely that the X-14 may have been the first aircraft to have a pink circle for landing and takeoff. The X-14's flight test program started on the 17th of February 1957 and it completed the evaluation series for Bell in 1959. The Air Force then taking the plane over for an extended series of further general VTOL testing and pilot familiarisation. Extended seems an inadequate word actually, as the plane was to continue to be used by the Air Force and NASA until the 29th of May 1981. It was that day damaged in an accident and was written off as no longer airworthy. Today, fittingly for such a productive and successful little pioneer, it's preserved in a museum. Work on various schemes continued all over the world. In Germany, the Dornier 31 was a combination of lift jet and vectored thrust configurations. The Lockheed Company invested a lot of its energy in augmented jet lift, in yet another method of heaving a plane straight up. Here, the theory stated that introducing jet thrust into a chamber of air would create additional lift from the engine's power by the rush of air into the chamber. And this was undoubtedly true, as it had been repeatedly shown to occur in test installations. However, in working the system into an aeroplane, the weight penalties of the installation went a long way to cancelling out the augmented thrust of the power plant, and Lockheed's Hummingbird was not a raging success, being later rebuilt with dedicated lift engines to test a completely different configuration. The use of lift-only jets by Lockheed and Dornier followed what seemed to be the emerging dominant pattern, using a number of small jets which only worked when the plane was in hover. The main engines were much larger power plants which operated in all phases of flight. The weight penalties of this are obvious, but they would be partially compensated for. A plane that had only its main power plant to obtain lift would need an extravagantly big engine which would, in normal flight, never be called upon to deliver much of its available power. Of course, what happened to change the status quo was a breakthrough engine, developed by the Bristol Company in England, the Pegasus. Around this engine, the Hawker Company were able to develop their P1127, forerunner of the Kestrel and then the Harrier. The 1127 was a major step forward, an emphatic proof of the thrust vectoring approach and drew extensively on the data obtained in the X-14 program. It was designed around the new engine, but for once, this did not place too unreasonable a set of demands upon the plane's shape or capability. The creation of a new engine is an expensive business, and to create a new engine for one application places a huge research and development load onto only one customer. And in the case of the P1127 and its basic development into the Kestrel, a lot of cost went into producing only a handful of aeroplanes. When the Kestrel project was completed, a lot of time and effort was put into design of a supersonic version, the P1154 and this almost caused the abandonment of the whole area of research by the company due to the huge bills involved and the lack of UK government support. Eventually, the plane that did emerge from Hawkers was a subsonic fighter and initially there was little to no enthusiasm from the fighter pilots who preferred to be at the controls of something that went considerably faster, preferably with as much glamour as possible. Today, the Harrier has come a long way 
and the new AV-8B model incorporates a large number of advances and improvements. Though still subsonic, it now has doubled load capacity and range. The Harrier's successful use in combat and the successful development of tactics for its pilots have combined to underline that it is one of today's most potent and dangerous fighting machines, and it has been adopted for various uses. The McDonnell Douglas Company has been involved in the project, together with British Aerospace, and the two companies have cooperatively developed the Harrier's capability and refined its airframe to ensure that it remains the most capable vertical takeoff plane in the world, at least for the moment. Who knows what will be next, or what method it will use. In 1971, the United States Air Force Tactical Air Command issued a specification for a short takeoff and landing advanced medium transport. This was intended as a replacement for the C-130 Hercules. The entries from McDonnell Douglas and Boeing were adjudged the best of those submitted, and the two companies were asked to proceed with prototypes. The McDonnell plane, the YC-15, drew heavily on the company's experience with licensed production of the Bruges 941 deflected thrust transport. And the new plane was a logical extension of the 941 concept, replacing that plane's propellers with jet engines. The fuselage internal dimensions had been laid out in the specification. These resulted in a fat 120-foot fuselage with a DC-10 nose and a loading ramp under the upswept tail. The tail surfaces consisted of a tall fin carrying the horizontal stabiliser high up, away from the jet exhausts. The tail surfaces were of a large area to enhance slow speed control. At the wing's trailing edge were double slotted deflection flaps to direct the engine's thrust downward. The four engines were fitted with mixers to bring outside air to mix with the exhaust to cool it, but the deflection flaps still had to be made of titanium to cope with the heat. Two prototype YC-15s were built, and the first flight took place on the 28th of August 1975. Performance included speeds up to 518 miles per hour and payload up to 78,000 pounds. The relatively straightforward approach the plane took, with its huge mechanical intervention from the deflection flaps, based as it was on established technology, proved effective in giving the plane good results in the primary design aim, short takeoff and landing and after a competition with the Boeing plane in fly-offs during 1976 and 1977, the YC-15 was declared the winner. However, this proved to be a hollow victory, as funding cuts saw the whole program cancelled in favour of the much more economic purchase of more of Lockheed's venerable Hercules. The Boeing entry, the YC-14, was an extremely different aircraft, though it too relied upon the deflection of the engine's thrust to obtain immediate lift, as well as the lift provided by the air on top of the wing. However, where the McDonnell plane directed its engines under the wing and then trapped them with a huge lowering air dam to deflect them downward, the Boeing had its engines placed to blow back over the top of the wing. There, the airflow was caught and deflected by the flaps which, when lowered, formed a smooth curve that relied upon the Coanda effect to divert the airflow. Wing lift was enhanced by full span leading edge flaps and by blowing compressed air from holes in the leading edge to obtain boundary layer control. Spoilers were used to supplement the ailerons in low speed roll control and to control the sink rate on landing approach. Thrust reversal was upward, which reduced the tendency to raise a dust cloud on unprepared landing strips and enhanced braking by pushing the plane onto the ground. Two YC-14s were built, and the first flight was made on the 9th of August 1976. 
the plane demonstrated the ability to take off in 600 feet and land in 400, and it exhibited several other notable features, not the least of which was its quietness, a concept not usually associated with VTOL and Stoll aircraft, where the engines are often screaming at full thrust in takeoff. The YC-14s operated from dirt fields and passed a range of other tests in the competition with the McDonnell plane. But despite its sophistication and success, it was not chosen as the winner of the competition. That the McDonnell plane was abandoned as well is probably not of much consolation to the Boeing team who drew up the 14's plans. In parallel to the numerous attempts to get a plane to act like a helicopter, there has been a drive to squeeze the last drop of potential out of the helicopter, and given that there's an absolute limit to how much use a rotor can be after it's got you into the air and you want to travel fast, the drive has been to add forward propelling engines to basic chopper shapes and let the rotors become essentially huge centres of drag. These are called compound helicopters. Howard Hughes built this huge compound helicopter, complete with engines on the tips of the huge rotor to drive it. Over the years, there have been a lot of variations on the theme, with or without wings, and an advance of over 50% has been made in the attainable speed. Mind you, there's no helicopter today that can fly as fast as the piston-engined fighters of the late 40s, let alone even look at what today's fighters can get up to when they're in a hurry. One of the obvious things to do is to put the rotors away when you're not using them. But this is not as easy as it sounds, and although several designs which incorporate stowing the rotors after takeoff have been developed, none have been successfully built. The other point about this is, of course, that once you've stowed the rotor away, your plane is just a plane until you take them out again. Whereas the developed and working technology of the Harrier, for example, allows chopper like behaviour at all times. Today's advanced helicopters have come a long way and refinements continue to appear. But the limits on rotary winged aircraft appear set to stay with us and the future will probably see the two schools of vertical flight, choppers and VTOL planes, go on in coexistence, performing their respective roles.
If you make a list of the elements you'd expect to find in an aeroplane, things like wings, tail, fuselage, you'll find that at some stage of aviation's history, some designer has done away with each of them. Some makes of aircraft have not had wheels, others have lacked fuselage and tail. The variety of shapes that have appeared at one time or another as aeroplanes is staggering. Yet, for each of them, there was a design idea that logically directed the outcome. Admittedly, some of the premises on which various shapes were based were either wrong or simply perverse, and some indeed look, if not insane, then certainly bizarre. We have our conception of what looks normal in an aeroplane, yet today's conception bears little to no relation to the first flying machines, and probably will bear only limited similarity to the leading edge of future aircraft design. It is, however, also true to observe that designers often pursue ideas that are ahead of their time, and that there are many instances, like the flying wing, where one era's designs had to await another era's technology or need to be proceeded with. began, it was not so much a matter of questionable data, there was no real understanding of what made flight possible. There were some ideas available that observably worked, but the essence of how they worked would not in fact be answered for many years. Hence, much common sense was wasted in following assumptions that were based on wrong interpretations of why some flying machines did work. In today's sense, there was no scientific basis to the avenues explored by designers. They tended to follow engineering ideas and mechanical advances, operating on a combination of intuition and experience that often led them astray, sometimes fatally. Quite often, their results looked downright comic to our eyes, though presumably, at the time, the designs that worked looked no less unlikely than those that didn't. By the 1940s, the variety of shapes considered were, in the main, based around configurations that we would recognise clearly as capable of flight, although still there was a certain amount of hopeful supposition about some elements. Here, Alexander Savesky, who founded what was to become the Republic Corporation, shows a model of his pet project for a long-range passenger seaplane. With its huge retractable pontoons and accommodation within the wings, the plane displays an attachment to past certainties, harking back to the flying boats. But it also exhibits quite modern considerations of drag, and, one suspects, had it been built, it would have been fairly successful in meeting its design objectives. At the time, it represented the informed view of an aviation expert on what the future of the aeroplane would be. Today's designer looks to the future with the aid of sound scientific information and the huge capability of computers to study and assess his propositions. The shapes he looks at in his considerations of future demand can be extensively tested without being built, and those that will be built will have already been refined to extreme tolerances, with little to no uncertainty about their ability to perform. The restrictions he has to conform to relate to the complexity of the aeroplane and the cost of its construction. The shape of a plane is, of course, largely dictated by its function, and enough is known to suggest a shape once the parameters of the job a plane is to do are defined. For much of aviation's history, however, trial and error has been the order of the day. The Wright Brothers plane was configured with the propeller behind the wing, with the blades pushing the plane through the air. This arrangement recurred throughout the piston-engined era, with several notable and successful aircraft being pushers. The Japanese Shinden, or Magnificent Lightning, of World War II was not only a pusher, but employed canar winglets in a tail-first arrangement that's reappeared in very modern fighters of today. 
Although orders for the plane were placed, it never made it into production. During World War II, the US Air Force experimented with several advanced pusher-propped piston-engine fighters. One of the adventurous designs was the Northrop XP-56, a plane that showed its lineage in its tailless design, complex control systems and swept back wing. It was originally designed without a dorsal fin, but one was added before its first flight on the 6th of September 1943. The plane used contra-rotating propellers spinning behind the fins. The first example crashed due to undercarriage failure and the plane was a total write-off. The pilot, John Myers, though badly injured, survived and recovered to fly again. With its wingtip Venturas, Elevons, air-operated bellows rudders and wing root intakes, the XP-56 exhibited the innovation and design daring that was the hallmark of the Northrop company. Only two XP-56s were built but for such an extreme design, they were quite successful planes. The Germans, meanwhile, were developing the Dornier 335 with propellers at both ends. The plane actually went into series production, but only a few had been delivered to the Luftwaffe by the end of the war. Here, the designer's experimentation with engine placement saw two embedded in tandem in the fuselage, one behind the cockpit driving the rear propeller by means of a shaft. Two versions of the 335 went into production, the single-seat fighter bomber and a two-seat night fighter. One of the successful pusher concepts, and certainly the biggest, was the B-36 Peacemaker, with its six engines positioned along the trailing edge of its huge wing. One of the main reasons for this arrangement was so that the wing's lift was not disrupted by the engine nacelles and the airflow over the wings was not disturbed by the massive turbulence of the propellers. The arrival of the jet engine set a whole new range of problems and options to the designers. Not the least of the considerations they now faced was the limited power of the early jets, which saw the emergence of aircraft like the Junkers 287, which, in addition to its forward-swept wings, employed multiple engines, in this case in a pair on the nose and another pair on the wings. And this still left the Junkers light on for power, and it often employed rocket pods to assist takeoff. The Germans experimented with several large multi-engined jets and some of their designs have either influenced or mimicked the efforts of post-war designers in other countries. Martin's XB-51 had two of its three engines slung on pylons under the fuselage, with the third mounted in the tail. The placement of the engines was decided upon to keep the intakes clear of the disturbed air around the plane's fuselage. One reason for such an arrangement. Another reason for an arrangement where the engines sit clear of the fuselage on pylons is best exemplified by the A-10, where the possibility of damage to one engine sending bits of debris into the other is minimised by keeping the engines as far apart as possible, so that hopefully the plane will survive battle damage. The location of the engines of a plane and the number of engines to be used remain variables that designers weigh in developing new aircraft. Even today, new planes appear with shapes that we find odd, like the way that the nearly familiar shape of Boeing's YC-14, suggesting the Hercules and Lockheed's other transports, is disrupted by the positioning of the engines in their barrel-like housings before the wing. This is no accident or whim, but reflects the particular role intended for the plane, with the wings deflecting the engine's thrust to shorten takeoff. Heinkel 162, 
designed in the last desperate months of the war to be rapidly mass-produced by slave labour, simply lumped the engine on top, giving it clean airflow and keeping it away from the wing to avoid disruption of the wing's lift, and perhaps also because such a location was a simple and cheap design option. This location of the engine appeared in other designs for the Luftwaffe and was also suggested much later by the North American company's YF-107, developed from a design study conducted around the F-100 Super Sabre. The F-107 had a large dorsal intake directly behind the pilot's position. The designers surely had their good reasons for adopting the configuration, but the pilots were also justified in their detestation of the idea of being both unable to see behind them and unable to be certain that upon ejecting from the plane they would not be sucked into the intake or impaled upon it. The 107 flew well and was considered a formidable proposition but was edged out of selection by the Air Force by the F-105. Only three 107s were built and the pilots never got to test the designers promises that ejection would be safe. With a plane like the F-107, with the jet buried in the fuselage, the disruption to the exterior of the plane is caused by intakes to supply air to the engine. In the past 50 years, jet engines have appeared in almost every possible position in the basic form of an aeroplane that's imaginable. An obvious position was to sling the engine underneath, accepting the drag penalty and simplifying the construction. However, this plane, Messerschmitt's P-1101, had another feature that made it the subject of a lot of Allied attention after the war. It employed a variable position wing with three fixed positions between 35 and 45 degrees of sweep set before takeoff. From this basis, the engineers at the Bell Corporation, under Robert Woods, developed a practical in-flight variable sweep wing mechanism. The result, complex but functional, was fitted to the company's X-5 experimental plane, the first successful swing wing aircraft. One side benefit of the X-5 was that the plane had appalling spin characteristics and was difficult to fly. And studies of what was wrong with the design revealed a lot of information about how to interpret wind tunnel data and further contributed significantly to an understanding of what made a plane susceptible to such bad spin behaviour. The advantage of a swing wing like the F-111s is that it allows the plane to take advantage of the higher lift provided by a straight wing at lower speeds and also to sweep the wing back to minimise drag problems at high speed. The designers have incorporated the virtues of both options, avoiding making a choice and limiting the plane's potential. Of course, the variation in approaches to wing shape and placement has been large and, as with the question of engine placement, much theorising and testing has gone on and a great variety of shapes has been seen at one time or another. Of course, not only do wings provide lift, they provide drag, turbulence and weak points. Hence, as planes have become faster and the drag and turbulence as well as the forces operating on the wing have become greater, attention to the wing shape has heightened. Alexander Lippisch, the German designer of the Delta Wing, came to the US after the war and developed the idea for Convair into the XF-92. A delta wing gives advantages in allowing a thin wing but one that still contains a lot of storage space. It also provides a large wing area to allow slower takeoff and landing speeds and shifts the control surfaces well aft of the centre of gravity. To counter the desirable aspects, there is a tendency to inferior spin recovery and a requirement for high angle takeoff and landing attitude. The XF-92, with its extravagant fin, is an extreme delta configuration. The B-58 Hustler, another Convair Delta Wing, with its dramatic plan form, is perhaps one of the most memorable of these designs. It was the Air Force's first supersonic bomber, but was caught by the development of both anti-aircraft and intercontinental ballistic missiles, and was not produced in as large a run as had originally been envisioned. Another approach to the shape of planes was that taken by the McDonnell Company in developing its first aircraft. The company had been making components for other manufacturers, but was determined to strike out in its own right. In the clamour of war, the Air Force was busy with procurement and production designs were given higher priority in access to materials and funding than were experimental types. 
The only high priority prototypes were those for jet powered and night fighter designs. McDonnell were perhaps lucky therefore to get backing for their experimental plane. The company's first design, the XP67, a twin engine single seat monoplane that was known as the Bat, was far from conventional and reflected radical choices in configuration. Two prototypes were ordered in October 1941, but the first wasn't to fly until January 1944. The laminar flow airfoil sections were maintained throughout the design, with the fuselage and nacelles blended into the large wing surface. This form of long sweeping curves expanding and contracting lent the plane a unique appearance and gave it a very large internal volume while maintaining a small frontal area. The shape contained enough space for large fuel tanks, pressurised cockpit, tricycle undercarriage and six 37mm cannon. The supercharged engines utilised their exhausts for extra thrust and the plane employed many experimental or advanced design features. Unfortunately, the engines provided failed to deliver the expected power and the bat never was pushed to see how fast its shape could actually go. The laminar flow streamlining of the plane represents an approach to one of the persisting and intractable problems of aerodynamics, what is referred to as boundary layer turbulence. This contributes about 80% of the friction drag created by a plane, with that friction drag representing approximately half of all drag working against an aircraft. The boundary layer is the very thin layer of air next to the surface of an aircraft in flight. When the flow of this air is uniform, that is when the particles move in parallel and don't intermingle, the airflow is said to be laminar. Natural flow of this type is rare. The boundary layer generally breaks up into a turbulent flow as it passes over the wing and fuselage, resulting in a sharp increase in friction drag. The study of laminar flow control was initiated by a number of researchers around the world during the mid-1930s, with most of them approaching the problem from the standpoint of streamlining believing that a perfect shape could be developed that would ensure clean air around a plane. As they saw it, the idea was to maintain laminar flow by scientifically shaping aerofoils and related aerodynamic bodies, and they achieved considerable success in theoretical pursuit of this aim. However, that success was limited overall in that with the structures they designed, it was found that the stability of the natural laminar boundary layer profile was too low at high speed to withstand even very small disturbance. A more successful approach has proven to be mechanical intervention, removing the innermost part of the boundary layer with very small amounts of suction through a porous skin. This is, however, too expensive and hard to maintain to be much practical use in production aircraft, and the problem remains. The XP-67, representing perhaps the most extreme example of streamlining, did show favourable wind tunnel results through extensive testing. But ultimately, it was a nice try at something impossible. It must be added that the bat was not just strange, but in its own way quite beautiful. After a generally unsatisfactory performance in testing, due in no small part to the limits of the engines, the first XP-67 crashed on September the 6th, 1944, and the second example was cancelled, bringing the career of the bat to a close. The forward thinking of the blending of fuselage and wings has been one of the faces of aircraft design that has lived on being refined into some of today's production designs. Perhaps the most famous example is shrouded in secrecy, the redoubtable SR-71, Kelly Johnson's delta-winged blackbird. Another plane with blended shapes is the variable geometry B-1, which has emerged from its off-and-on development as one of today's most potent military aircraft. Fast, capable of nap of the earth flight and using a battery of inboard computers. Its sleek lines and advanced avionics combine in a form that is dictated by its mission, 
Incursion by manned bombers into hostile airspace being so difficult today that the plane's only hope of success in carrying out a mission lies in its stealth and electronic countermeasures abilities. In the realm of fighters, too, the softening of shapes has persisted, with General Dynamics F-16 being a prime example of modern design. Here, the most important aspect of the design is that it's deliberately unstable, having its center of gravity too far to the rear, and the plane is kept flyable by the constant ministrations of computers. The advantage of this arrangement being in augmented maneuverability. Without the computers, the plane would porpoise uncontrollably. With the computers, it's one of the world's top air superiority weapons. The X-3, with its arrow headlines, showed another approach to high-speed wings, limiting them to the stubby squared fins that were to reappear on the F-104 Starfighter. In 1950, another American fighter that drew upon German wartime research made its first flight, the Vought F-7U Cutlass, a carrier fighter for the United States Navy that started another of the design genealogies we can trace to the current day. The Cutlass was an extreme design for its time, a tailless single-seater with two after-burning turbojets and twin rudders midway out on the 38-degree swept-back wing's trailing edge. The wings had an aspect ratio of 3 to 1 and leading edge slots. This layout offered advantages for a carrier-based aircraft, for it offered a high rate of climb and top speed, combined with compactness when the plane's squared wings were folded. Two hundred and ninety cutlasses were built, and they proved to be an extremely strong aircraft with great performance but they suffered a high attrition from accidents and their time on the inventory was to be cut short. They stayed in service only three years after production stopped in 1955. However, looking at several of today's fighters, we can see echoes of the F-7U's shape. Here, the designers had done away with the conventional tail of an aircraft and its attendant drag and turbulent vortices. The predictable elements of an aeroplane must therefore be seen as options, dictated to by the nature of the task at hand. Planes with no tail offer advantages for some functions. And the Cutlass, like today's F-14, was an excellent carrier-based fighter. At the same time as the Cutlass was going out of service, NASA and the Air Force both began series of tests on another lineage. This time, not only was the tail missing, so were the wings. The functional specifications for this aircraft were completely new. It was to be a flyable orbiter, a spacecraft that could be flown back to a landing after surviving hypersonic speeds and extreme heat in re-entry. The descriptive normally applied to these shapes is lifting bodies. They do, in fact, have a wing-like aerofoil cross-section, but it's the whole fuselage. The shapes avoid having any flat planes to present to friction in re-entry with their softened belly lines and nose. They were designed to present minimal drag in their long, semi-powered glides. It was planned that they would have their own rocket motors to allow them to manoeuvre in the Earth's atmosphere and land in a fairly conventional way. The lifting bodies arose out of research conducted by NASA, which was picked up on by the Air Force in considering a project for reusable spacecraft that must be seen as the grandfather of today's space shuttle. NASA's HL-10 and M2F2 were both constructed by Northrop and both had fairly checkered careers. They proved to be extremely tricky things to fly. They were tested and flown successfully, though of course they never achieved the grander aims of their designers in the main because the technology of that era and indeed still today's technology could not provide the materials or the avionics to allow such a plane to be successfully built. The 
the lifting bodies were essentially constructed to carry out experiments that would supply a database for the development of related materials and dynamics. At the time, two schools of thought were emerging from the chaos of the early days of space research. One, concerned with ballistic re-entry, argued that an object re-entering from space should be allowed to plunge into the atmosphere directly. The counter-idea was that the re-entering body be shaped to allow a somewhat slower, controlled atmospheric penetration, with return to a landing under conventional aerodynamic control. The two schools were poles apart. A lifting re-entry vehicle would be significantly more advanced and technologically far more demanding. It would, of course, also be far more useful, but not only would it have to withstand the stresses of being launched, but it would have to perform in four different regimes of flight. Space, hypersonic transatmospheric, transonic inside the atmosphere, and subsonic prior to landing. However, the complexity of the task was not as daunting as the potential rewards were alluring. A large number of different configurations for a trans-atmospheric vehicle had been proposed during the course of the early space program, but few suggested viable solutions to the extraordinary problems of re-entry. The research had led in 1958 to NASA's M2 configuration, a half cone with a rounded nose. Theoretically, such a vehicle would permit reductions in G requirement from eight to possibly as low as one. Development work had shown that the plane was barely stable in subsonic flight and repeated modification was undertaken in arriving at the shape of the M2F2 seen here. After the modifications, the shape exhibited an almost conventional airfoil cross-section. The M2F2 and the HL-10, NASA's two test aircraft, went through an extended series of glide tests and powered flight tests with successful firing of their rocket engines and in-flight controlled manoeuvres. Although their handling characteristics were not ideal, they were both flyable and served successfully as test vehicles. The NASA tests on their lifting bodies followed considerable work by scientists and engineers working within NASA's own facilities, developing the basic theories of the aircraft and also constructing and testing a model of the proposition, the M2F1. This was fairly rudimentary, with a fixed undercarriage simply bolted to the bottom of the plywood and tubular steel body, and had been primarily concerned with the practical assessment of the lift generated by the shape and the controllability of such a vehicle. Originally towed behind a car, the model had gone on to being tested as a glider towed behind the NASA C-47. As can be seen from this sequence, the M2F1 shape provided a lot of lifting power as the little aircraft soared above its target takeoff. Earlier, the Air Force had been involved in the Boeing X-20 Dinosaur program and the Martin X-23 tests. These had also been involved in the same problem, the design of reusable, controllable re-entry vehicles, and the X-23 in particular had been a forerunner of the lifting body configuration. The Dinosaur, cancelled in 1963, had never actually progressed beyond the construction of mock-ups but a lot of the work done in proving technologies and materials to be used in the program was of great value years later in the development of the Rockwell Space Shuttle. The fat little X-23s, four of which were built, were actually launched in 1966 and 67 and pioneered much work in heat shielding and cooling systems that remains valuable.
The Air Force involvement with the X-23 and the dinosaur was directed at study of flight at high speed outside the atmosphere and complementary studies of the behaviour of lifting bodies inside the atmosphere in glide and landing tests similar to those with the NASA craft were conducted by the X-24 planes. This was actually the same plane rebuilt. Originally the X-24A, based on research by the Martin Company, the plane was rebuilt as the X-24B, with a totally different appearance, to reflect theoretical studies conducted by the Air Force itself. The X-24 program overall was successful in demonstrating the theoretical advantages of the lifting body shape for the role of reusable piloted spacecraft. And further, they demonstrated reliable controllability beyond that of the earlier NASA models. Overall, the lifting body tests conducted at Edwards during the 1960s laid the groundwork and pointed the way for the development of the first functioning reusable craft, the Space Shuttle. However, they also dispelled some of the wilder hopes in relation to the concept of such space vehicles and spelled out the painful message about the enormous cost and the technological challenge involved in such dreams. In addition, they demonstrated that such craft would be difficult work for the pilot, demanding extreme care and precision. The testing program saw many potentially dangerous situations develop and it was perhaps partially a matter of luck as much as skill that there were no fatalities during the program. It's probably true to say that no experimental planes testing can be thought of as free of danger. Wherever the scientists and designers push into the realm of the theoretical or the unknown, there's always the potential for the unforeseen to send things seriously astray. This is probably platitudinous. Certainly it can be accommodated by Murphy's law without the need to delve into chaos theory. Where the lifting bodies incorporated the aerofoil into the fuselage and did away with the wings, there's long been another school of design that reversed this to make the plane all wing, doing away with the fuselage and tail. In this case, though here we're looking at the German Horton flying wing of the Second World War, the leading voice and the leading practitioner of the design school was an American. The Horton brothers' work was based upon the vision of a man who pursued the dream of the flying wing from very early on, building his first such aircraft, a Balsa model, in 1923. He was to doggedly pursue that dream for three decades, convinced that one day the skies would be filled with flying wings. Not a wide-eyed visionary, he was an experienced and successful aviation designer, Jack Northrop, seen here on the left. And he had the knowledge and expertise to see his dream come to fruition, and in fact, to build a series of planes to prove his case. However, it was to be a long time before a flying wing was to go into full production. In 1940, Northrop built and flew the N1M as preliminary research to lead up to a large bomber. It was to be followed by a series of variations over the next few years. Next was the N9M, which was a 60-foot model of the bomber to come. But Northrop was also concerned to build flying wings to cover the whole spectrum of military needs, and new planes appeared at regular intervals. To an outsider, there must have been a somewhat obsessive quality about the constant evolution of the types. With the concept so radical, there was plenty of tinkering to do to establish the safest and most controllable configuration and adopt it for use. Along the way, there were to be several notable achievements, including the MX-324, which was the first rocket-powered aircraft to fly in America. appeared to fill every niche, even that of pulse jet powered flying bomb, but the aim was directed at building big flying wing bombers, and the first of these was the XB-35. The Air Force had ordered two prototypes in November 1941, and followed this with a contract for 13 test planes. Wartime plans to build 200 at the Martin Company's Omaha plant were dropped, but the plane proceeded, slowly but surely, towards completion. The first flight came on June the 25th, 1946. The crew consisted of nine men 
and there was accommodation for an additional six relief crewmen. The relief were necessary because the plane was designed to be capable of a cruising range of over 10,000 miles. The first three flying wings were powered by Pratt & Whitney piston engines, but an order placed on the 1st of June 1945 saw the next two planes completed with Allison J-35 jets as XB-49s, and by 1947 the first of these had been rolled out ready for testing. No less than eight of the engines were installed, fed by intakes in the leading edge. The effect of these fuel-hungry early jet engines on the plane's range was catastrophic, bringing it back to an estimated 4,000 miles if the wing was carrying a reasonable bomb load. This range penalty did, of course, apply to all the early jet bombers. The XB-49 first flew on October the 21st, 1947, and the plane was soon to demonstrate its worth, averaging over 500 miles per hour on some of its extended test flights. It's worth noting that the Air Force at the time was also working with the Convair Company on the B-36, the massive six-piston engine post-war strategic bomber that was to go into full production. This plane, which was to be the Air Force's strategic backbone for the next 10 years, was never to approach 500 miles per hour, even with added jets on later models. However, in late 1947, within the range limitations of the Thirsty Jets, the XB-49 program was running smoothly, and the Air Force placed orders for more bombers and for a reconnaissance version. The heart of the idea of the wing was that without the drag and turbulence of the fuselage and tail, a plane with a given power plant and fuel storage would be able to carry a comparable load further and faster than a conventional aircraft of similar specifications. And this was to prove to be largely true. The Northrop team were to overcome some very testing problems along the way, but the XB-49 was refined into a fine flying machine. Without the normal control surfaces, some very complex developments had to be made to give the pilot secure command of the craft. But measures of can-do and lateral thinking, coupled with the application of ingenuity and hard theoretical and practical work, gave the wing unique and fully functioning systems. The Air Force retained its doubts about whether the wing was a stable enough platform for bombing, and there were problems fitting the large and unwieldy nuclear weapons of the day into its bomb bay. But the XB-49 program had, by 1948, fully verified Jack Northrop's expectations and predictions and looked set for introduction into the Air Force inventory. However, in April 1949, the contracts were cancelled and the planes were scrapped, taking with them Northrop's dream of a world where the sky was filled with economical, efficient flying wings. Now, a preview of the flying wing transport of tomorrow. The midsection provides ample room for 80 passengers. Spaciousness keynotes the luxurious main lounge, extending 53 feet inside the wing. And future air travelers will really see something. Through the plexiglass windows of the front wing edge, passengers have an unimpaired view of the Earth, unrolling thousands of feet below. Coast-to-coast -coast flights in four hours may not be too far away. The dorsal tip of the plane provides an excellent vantage point to see the world go by. Snug as bugs in their magic carpet, air travelers can look down on mere earthlings as the double quartet of mighty turbo jets whistle them through space. The sleek air leviathan carries more cargo farther, faster, and with less fuel than any comparable plane. And the bar will raise the spirits of those who don't feel high enough in the stratosphere. The flying wing has the stability of a fine club. The public quickly accepts all the miracles that science provides. Even skyliners like this will become commonplace. But the giant flying wing is more than a super streamlined airplane. It is the fulfillment of scientific vision 
and symbolizes the practical dreams of science for our world of tomorrow. When the flying wing reappeared, it was not to be as a luxury liner of the skies, but as something altogether more advanced and dangerous. The stealth bomber, the B-2, built by Northrop's company, took to the air in 1989 after a long and secretive gestation, using developments of the controls of the XB-49 and owing a lot to the work done during that plane's construction and flight testing. Jack Northrop, old and infirm, had been one of very few people not directly involved in the program to be told anything about it. And he died knowing that his vision of the flying wing was to be fulfilled in this strange and menacing new shape. Who knows, the future may yet see flying wings abounding on the world's airways, but for the moment, this is the only flying wing in production. It is also one of the most astonishing triumphs of today's technology. Like the flying wing background of the B-2, the origins of the X-29 go back to work done over 50 years ago. This plane, built by the Grumman Corporation and first flown in December 1984, is in part designed to evaluate the assertions of research which was first presented in a scientific paper in 1935. The true value of that paper on swept wings, in relation to forward swept wings, has been impossible to test in the interim because of the inadequacies of the available technology. It was not until the development of advanced composites during the 1970s that there existed materials strong enough. Research and development is, like rust, constant. The creation of new materials, new avionics, new radars goes on, sometimes coincidental to potential applications to aircraft design. But with different new tools and materials, the designer can do different things to current shapes, old shapes or new shapes. Some of the plans for large hypersonic passenger craft submitted to the X-30 project look suspiciously like very, very large versions of the 1960 lifting bodies. Some look like Flash Gordon artwork, and some simply look like nothing that's ever been thought out loud previously. Behind all of them, there's a fair certainty that they would be able to be built and do the job. If we accept that each new design generation looks strange when it's introduced, then the next generation could strike us as downright weird. Don't hold your breath, perhaps, but keep looking to the skies. There will, we can assume, be more strange planes to come.
The X-29 has been designed to explore the advantages and disadvantages of several new technologies and theories. Advanced composites, a close coupled canard, variable camber, and a thin supercritical airfoil section, forward swept wing. The integration of these state-of-the-art technologies in a single airframe represents a major step forward in aircraft structural and aerodynamic engineering. Seen here on its first flight, with Grumman pilot Charles Sewell at the controls, the X-29 provides a glimpse of what a high-performance fighter of tomorrow might look like, and of what it might be able to do. On this and subsequent low-speed test flights, the plane's systems were evaluated and its instrumentation validated. In fact, the whole airplane had no discrepancies. Uh, as far as I've been, I'm concerned, the airplane could be refueled, turned around, and we could go in a few minutes. The technology tested not only the pilot, but had already tested the people at the Grumman factory in New York, where the plane was built. emotional thing to see the airplane fly and come back in the shape that it came back in. A very high sense of, of pride. Then it lifted off and your heart just kind of stops for a while. We saw the, the fruits of our labor. The X-29's construction commenced after an extended series of design studies and thousands of hours of wind tunnel time. The first metal was cut in January 1982, but the plane was not to be rolled out to meet the public eye until 1984. Throughout these years, Program Director Robert Romer and Deputy Program Director Glenn Spate have tackled some very complex and demanding problems, including many never previously encountered. The result is a very different plane indeed. The X-29 will allow the next generation aircraft to cruise efficiently, both uh, in subsonic flight as current fighters do, but for the first time to cruise efficiently supersonically. And that means uh, an airplane that can get to the fight quicker and get there safer, deliver its weapons and get back out again without being vulnerable to, uh, to enemy fire. The X-29 is controlled by a triple redundant system of computers and the pilot's commands are assessed by the computers before being put into action. This is, of course, to protect the plane and pilot from decisions that would place the aircraft out of control. Though the wings are constructed of advanced composites, the rest of the aircraft is mostly of conventional all-aluminium construction, with steel utilised in high structural load areas. The X-29s also use several major assemblies that are, in fact, used parts. The forward sections of the planes are from old Northrop X-5 fighters and several other components, including the main undercarriage, come from F-16s. In addition to its radical wings, the X-29 also employs variable incidence canar to provide pitch trim and control moments. Since this allows positive lift to trim and acts as a slat to protect the normally heavily loaded inboard section of the wing, the canard can also be unloaded at high angles of attack to prevent any hung stall or pitch-out tendencies. From its first flight in December 1984, the X-29 has been engaged in a series of test flights that have been outstandingly successful. Given that it's serving to explore many new technological areas at once, the test series was complex and busy. As the plane went through its paces over Edwards Air Force Base, its activity was monitored not only by the installations at the base, but information was relayed by satellite back to Grumman in New York. There, each step in the series was finally assessed. A data evaluation on receipt of the data in the station here, uh, and within a half a minute to a minute, uh, the determination is made that the maneuver is good and that, uh, that we can advise the pod to go on and uh, start the next maneuver.
At the rollout ceremony, then Vice President George Bush inspected the plane and was obviously impressed. That's a beautiful model, but they got the wing on backwards. <laughs> the X-29 represents an important step in the rebuilding of an American defense second to none. Grumman built two X-29s, and they were then carefully packed and shipped to California via the Panama Canal. When they left the factory, they left behind the workers who had given so much to the project. What you do reflects upon Grumman and yourself as a, an individual. It's really pride of workmanship. It was really something else. You know? It was really uh, fantastic. The biggest thing that I've ever worked on in my life in aircraft. Just the engineering in it is, is fabulous, I think. The biggest thrill was to see it fly. The high opinions of the Grumman workers were shared by the test pilots. I think the thing that impresses me about the airplane is the talent that has gone in it, the, uh, the thoroughness, and the, the performance of the airplane to date indicates that uh, people, that not only did they work hard, but they knew what they were doing. It is symbolic that the plane is in part a composite of other aircraft that it physically owes a lot to the designs that have preceded it. For it is also the result of a combination of theoretical advances that have informed one another and have been brought together. It is also symbolic of the predictable fact that the X-29 will add to the pool of information that informs a designer when he sets out to form a new aircraft. The X-29 is, of course, not the only advanced fighter design being tested. And there's no guarantee that there will be planes of the future that employ the forward sweep of its wing. However, there's no doubting that it's making significant contribution to the shape of those planes to come and to the controls and avionics that will be integrated into future fighters.